win it over, but that's like a giant oh, record Oh, barely, us. barely. What do we think about this setup? Do we feel good about it? I'm feeling good. How's everybody feeling? How's everyone doing? How was your weekend? It's kind of... Um... Je ne sais quoi. <laughs> you know, I think we should just send it. Yeah, I think we should too, because I want this to be an easy to watch back live stream when you know, people dick around at the beginning for like 12 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Would you guys like to see some dicking around or should we jump right in? <laughs> All right. Let's jump right in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that conference answers it. Conference weekend. How was your conference weekend, Tana? Oh, I my know... conference weekend was great. I just holed up in a cabin and relaxed with a lover and had a lovely, lovely time. Also oh, had your housewarming party. It was Which great, was really huh? good. Featuring our candle scent from Exmo Candles. So. We have a candle coming out that I'm, I genuinely think is the best candle I've ever smelled. And I've seriously spent, I'm not even going to tell you the most money I've ever spent on a candle because you're going to judge me. <laughs> but this candle, we like got together with Exmo Candles and we talked about what scents we really like. And they came up with this blend that is banana nut bread and coconut and it is burning right now. And this live stream is powered by the vibes of that scent. I had such a moment uh at the party when someone was like actually, it happened a couple times where someone was like this smell is so good I what know, is that and i was I like and it's our scent <laughs> fragrance des elfes <laughs> and it's soy and it's like a toxic free wick like sometimes the candle smells really good but it's like petroleum and you're like mm. Mm, it's like and they plant a tree <laughs> they plant a tree for every candle they sell anyway <laughs> this isn't about our dope candle release that's coming up this is about a general conference held by a dying church. We're here to talk about it. <laughs> Have you ever wondered the proper way to arrange deck, the deck chairs on the Titanic? Well, <laughs> there is an order to things that we need to follow. <laughs> is this better or worse? Wait, it's a different light. It, it's like brighter, but it's... Tell me about this one. Better or worse? Worse. Worse, okay. We'll just, we'll just press on like this. Uh -huh. Oh, ha, ha. Tech with Beck says I need those candles for real, for real. And for real, let for me real. tell you, <laughs> life will never smell so delectable. So what do we want to touch on first? Oh, boy. Oh, so we are accepting <laughs> super chats throughout this stream. If you want to derail the conversation at any point, please do. It is very hard to earn a living as a content creator. Um, Renee, I don't know how to say your last name, said you guys performed at the same event as my best friend Rocky. Thought that was cool. Yeah, Mormon Palooza was also this weekend. And Rocky was so good. I, they were like, uh, she was right after me and was so good. And I was like, I am so glad I didn't have to follow that act <laughs> because mm -hmm. incredible music. Okay, someone said the new strength of youth. I think that's a great place to start. I Let's have do about it. This. So... The TLDR is just that they've relaxed the rules, right? Yeah. They've taken out, and they, we kind of saw this, they tried to do this at BYU with removing the language about gay dating, mm -hmm. where they just remove it explicitly. Presumably because the church hasn't, or the church marketing department or whatever department is over this, has enough wherewithal to know that like this type of language about like the way women dress and stuff is not going to fly in 2022. Mm -hmm. So they've taken out a lot of the explicit language about what you can and can't do, which is, I imagine, leading a lot of people to believe that they can now get tattoos, blah, 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 mm -hmm. Thoughts? Well, what was your initial thought when you heard that? My initial thought is good. Anything that is, um, you know, tightening the grip that the organization has in the per personal lives of members, I think, is a step in the right direction. Whether it's, you know, there's that backhanded, like, passive aggression that's like, you're allowed to do this, but there will be consequences if you do. That's probably there. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the passive aggressive Mormon way. Yeah, but um, at least still, if it's on the time. books, I'm at least grateful that that's happening because yeah. any, any movement in that direction, sweet. Yeah, I think there'll be a transition period where there still will be a large chunk of members who do judge people for, you know, getting tattoos, all oh, that of stuff. Of course. But I do feel like thinking about, you know, just a lot of the people that are Mormons on Twitter at BYU, I think for a lot of people, they're just going to take it in their stride and probably start getting tattoos and stuff. And yeah, I did see a take that I've seen a number of people make that feels uh, important to bring up is there's already been like a kind of gaslighting that's happening of, pe of um, just people being like, well, you never had to follow it to begin <laughs> with. And so if you were traumatized <laughs> by these 
standards that were rigidly enforced at every <laughs> level of the church, which, let's be real, they were. Uh-huh. Except for, like, a, you know, there was some leniency with, like, bikinis in England and stuff like that. But in general, like, For the Strength of Youth was absolutely a guiding document for youth in the church. And now we have people being like, well, you could have still used your common sense and, like, it's your fault if you were traumatized by how rigid those rules were. <laughs> it's, your, it's your fault if you took this all literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's uh, just important to bring up. Also, Dear Mormon Me on Instagram, um, they posted a meme just discussing this For the Strength of Youth changes. And they have these little snapshots of the For the Strength of Youth throughout the years. Um, that just proves that all of this is just man-made bullshit. Obviously, we know it's man-made bullshit. But like uh, these, these things have never been inspired. But in every generation whatever the standards are there is a tendency for members to think that these standards come from god the this prophet, is the way that it's always when been. the prophet <laughs> says only have one earring you go out and you take out your second earring that day or that yep. talk who was it that gave that talk was it thomas s Watson? someone gave a talk that was like um you won't marry me just because i have a second earring and then the message was like you would let a second earring stand between you and your allegiance to the prophet or God or whatever it was. Totally. Peter, so thank that you. That one cup of coffee Obviously that'll keep you out of the celestial kingdom. If only you didn't like caffeine so much, you whore. Um, Pete was at the housewarming party. You oh, know, Pete. Pete, what's yeah. up? Hi. Thanks, Hello. brother. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, so in 1965, I just thought this was interesting because I didn't know all this. The For the Strength of Youth said, Few girls or women ever look well in backless or strapless dresses. Such styles often make the figure look ungainly and large, or they show the bony structures of the body. Again, you can't ever win with the patriarchy. You're either too bony or you're too large. You just really <laughs> got to find that straddling, invisible sweet spot. But I thought this was interesting because I love, as you go further back in church history, how much they'll phrase this stuff as if it's just like common sense. Like, clearly mm. women don't look good when they're wearing that. <laughs> but then, like, the styles change and then you see celebrities and it's just, yeah, it's bullshit. Uh. Um, in 1990, 72 they the strength of youth said girls should always try to look feminine in their dress they should not dress like boys or try to imitate a masculine appearance uh which uh which boys which masculine appearance <laughs> weren't weren't uh, pants first worn by women wasn't makeup first worn by men <laughs> wigs yeah, that feels very, like, of the moment, 1972. Uh, you know, women trying to be liberated. I remember there was one in the 60s, one where it talked about it is immodest for a woman to go out in public with curlers in her hair. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is really what God cares about. In 1990, it said if you wear immodest bathing suits because it's the style, it sends a message that you are using your body to get attention and approval and that modesty isn't important. Or that it's hot outside. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, a few different things that can be communicated. Or you just want to get an even tan. Oh, yeah. You, know? um, you can see how that, I mean, that was 1990. That wasn't the 2001 one, which was the most recent one before this. But, I mean, just the idea that what you wear is is asking for attention is, just, you know, that's not going to fly in 2022, is it? I just, um, I know we've already kind of touched on this, but it's always so fascinating to me how Mormons have this, like, snapshot idea about history and human existence that like the standards of today are the uh restored standards of the gospel because things never back change to the way god wanted it and god wants it like 1950s america yeah 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 but then you go back to 1950s america and you're like whoa this is crazy they were so into things and they that didn't would have matter. thought that things mormons were wearing now were a little bit risque exactly i was just talking with a mormon about uh this kind of thing we were talking about how uh, back in the day, Frank Sinatra was seen as like the ultimate corrupter of the youth. And now we're like, Frank Sinatra, that's music for moms. Like, yeah. Um, but there was a time where he was like censored and Elvis too, from the waist down, they didn't show him because right. they thought it was going to dra- calculate it to drive the kids to sex now. And in that conversation, it was kind of like, yeah, you know, you look back and you see how things have, have been so, uh, you know, people were so hyper repressed that that seems so crazy. And, and the Mormon kind of made the, the comment of like, well, it's kind of, well, then think about how bad things will be in the future. But I'm like, but then I said, well, well, was that stuff bad to begin with? Was Frank Sinatra ever bad? Right. So is the, are things getting worse? Is our tolerance for bad things getting worse? The idea or that- are we just letting go of shit that doesn't matter? And they were kind of like, oh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> it's wild that people think that putting the facts of human life into the light more rather than repressing them is mm. bad. Because what was Frank Sinatra bad for? Like kind of singing about sex in, mm. in a very like... You know, making whoopee in a pretty <laughs> failed way, but still just you know inviting. Mm. So, and it's like those things are a fact of life, whether or not 
you allow them to be in the light or not. As we always say, things that are desires that are repressed just come out in more dysfunctional ways. So, and also in cultures where they don't have strict modesty standards, for example, in cultures where boobs are just out all the time, like they're not sexualized in the same way. So it does, nothing, no one is hornier than like a repressed Mormon boy, you know, like a regular, even a regular teenager, well, actually, I don't know what regular teenager boys are like, <laughs> but you know what I mean? The Sad. average sort of worldly man that's having sex before marriage is not seeing a shoulder and having it instantly connect to sex. But uh, if you're a Mormon boy, you will. So actually you're making more things connect to the thing that you don't want people to be connecting to with these standards. And nobody is more aware of that than you, the recipient of so many oh, unhinged yeah. comments. I can't believe it. It's so telling when someone's like, it's like someone coming up to you and be like, your ankles, why are you trying to drive me to sex by showing your ankles? You're like, Guys, buddy, you gotta chill. <laughs> I was wearing gray boyfriend fit sweatpants the other day, just like baggy sweatpants. And then just like a little gray tank top, wasn't wearing a bra because I'm an A cup, not that that matters either way, but it's like, there is no functional use for a bra for me even. And someone commented and was like, um, I can't take you seriously. If you want to be treated seriously, stop trying to show off your body and use your body for just a comment about how I was clearly just deliberately trying to show off my body by wearing like a sweatsuit. It's like, I just have a body and, and people perceive it. I love this <laughs> idea that like you do this. She said at the end, well, I think a woman made I the comment, but I'm not certain. But she said, um, if you want to be taken seriously, like have some self-respect and dignity. I love the idea that like people can't get to your idea. They're so blinded by your body. That's all I hear from this. It's like you are so you are so blinded by my body that like you need to wade through that first before you can even get to my ideas. You would never like she wouldn't comment on a video of a man, even a shirtless man, I'm sure, and be like, I can't possibly like compute your ideas because your body's on show. It's just with women. You if know? I know somebody has nipples, I cannot, I cannot I listen engage. to them. <laughs> also, just want to point out that we're matching today. We didn't. Even I know plan we didn't plan it, and it's like a waffle knit kind of as well. Kind of. Um, I would like to thank JD Redemption for the super chat. We really, really appreciate that. You have personally redeemed me. Every single super chat right now is so meaningful to our depleted bank balances. And, <laughs> you know, it's much more well spent here than Mormon stories. Don't tell John I said that. 2001, the strength of youth said, never lower your dress standards for any occasion. Doing so sends the message that you're using your body to get attention and approval. What, if the, again, what if the occasion is the 2022 General Conference? <laughs> Can you lower the standards then? I know, right? <laughs> also, it's funny because someone commented on my video. What was the video I've been talking about? Um... What? It was me just saying it's like ridiculous for Russell M. Nelson to get up and condemn abuse like without having any acknowledgement of how the church participated in that system. But um, it's funny because that comment was just echoing the language that's in the For the Strength of Youth. So all the people that are like, oh, well, you, you know, you don't have to rigidly follow it. It's like, well, clearly these ideas permeate because on a video in 2022, I'm hearing language that was in the 1990 and 2001 For the Strength of Youth pamphlet. Also used to say, do not disfigure your body with tattoos or body piercings. Unless it's part of your culture or you really want to. <laughs> you would, it would be, t your body is a temple. And temples, as we know, are covered in your murals and carvings. And, oh wait. <laughs> so now it just says, as you make decisions about your clothing, hairstyle, and appearance, ask yourself, am I honoring my body as a sacred gift from God? Heavenly Father wants us to see each other for who we really are, not just physical bodies. Hmm, but his beloved children with divine destiny. I mean, that is a massive improvement on the message, right? Oh, yeah. But also is a little bit weird to be thinking about your body through the end of like, through the means of like some man owns it. Mm. And like, am I honoring the man who owns my body with the way that I dress? Still feels a little bit, you know, still got some issues there. What do you guys think? Um, it's... I mean, obviously good. It's a good update. It's going to be tough for the members that have grown up with scrupulosity and it's like they need, you know, how many people had to do the EFY thing where you, where especially girls lift your hands up, bend over. Like so many people have gone through so much humiliation. As, as kids, when your body is developing and it's just so raw and weird anyway. And then now to move on from that, I mean, yeah, amazing. But like you've also wired a lot of people to think in that scrupulous way for so long. I wonder if some people are going to have a hard time, like people that kind of, have OCD tendencies. I wonder if it's going to be tough for them having to ask a bit more of a qualitative rather than quantitative question about how they dress. Mm -hmm. um, it's tying into the Nelson thing about abuse. It's like you said, 
there is a system in place that enables abuse in the LDS church. The, the Spotlight journalist pointed that out in the AP article. And so just to be like, abuse is bad without uh, addressing the systems that feed into mm-hmm. that is so, so silly. And it's so easy to see <clears throat> that trickling down into language about dress and appearance. Think of how many times... Uh, can anyone attest? Holy shit, Michael Turner. Michael Turner. <laughs> I'll finish that thought in a second, but wow, <laughs> thank you. Who gives a shit what you were saying? Oh my god, oh the my gay god, agenda. The gay oh my god, the gay agenda. Round of and super chats. Chats. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. <laughs> that is seriously so it's, nice. Thank you so it much. It means so much. Um, I was going to say, think of how many people, uh, young women, were told as children in their own homes that they needed to change their clothes so that they weren't tempting their father, their brothers, the I bishop. With that. Like what they're doing is setting a stage where it's like you are responsible for adults or interactions with you as children. As it's, children, that is pedophile culture. And I would have loved to have had, you know, if this was a church that was truly committed to just like truth and righteousness. Then get up and explain, not that this is necessarily their reasoning, because their reasoning all just comes down to PR and retaining members, we know that. But I would have loved a talk at conference where someone said, we've decided to remove that language about how, you know, if you dress immodestly, if you show your shoulders, then you're using your body to get attention, because that really feeds into rape culture, this idea that the way a woman dresses, like, can kind of determine how much she deserves or is inviting getting raped like I would have loved a more explicit like here's why we're removing that language because we've realized these things about what it does no it's just the sweep it under the rug (laughs) gaslight anyone who's complaining about how much these standards hurt them when they were a kid and how much they were taught as a kid that these standards came from God and it's like well God sure seems to update his standards a lot based on the time for someone who's unchanging now and forever Mm mm-hmm in 2022, it's bad for 16-year-olds to go on dates. In 1822, it was great for 16-year-olds to marry the prophet. <laughs> Things never change around here, though. Um, we've got even more super Thank chats. You, so you guys much. are being so nice. Rachel today. Thank in you so pounds much. as well. Can I tell you my toxic trait is that every time I see the pound symbol, I think it means liters because it's like in my head I go five liters because it's kind of an L. Oh, liters. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we don't use the metric system as much over here. Also, thank you, Virginia. Come, everybody, go to Philip's house tip job. Thank you. <laughs> It's been a frugal month. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said they met uh, Brad Wilcox over the weekend. Oh, I heard he gave a that? prayer. Our old buddy, B Rad. B Rad, B Town, USA. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, let's let's maybe move on to. I mean, actually, though, this is good to bring up. On this meme I'm looking at by Dear Mormon Me, um, they write. This past week, I was flooded with hundreds of messages. People shared stories of how these rigid black and white rules affected their lives in dire ways. We removed earrings as our prophet declared this disfigured our body. We were denied entry to church dances and activities. Yeah, I remember not being... I wasn't even a member, and I had to go out and change into someone's random T-shirt from the boot of their car because I had a tiny slit in my shoulder as a 16-year-old girl. They made Renee Zellweger go home and change. We were told to wear t-shirts over swimsuits because adult males would be present at girls' camp. Fuck that. We were horrified by and hated our developing bodies, layering clothes and adjusting our purses so as not to call attention to our curves. Yeah. I really don't know that these male leaders have, have a sense of like how much these dress standards... Again, like it's society already had set us all up for failure in terms of hating our bodies, but then adding to it that it was like, you know, your body is like this almost like perversion in it you know like you're Mm. like gross for showing it really just fucks with your brain so much like even when I was married it's like I still just didn't like my body I had no I didn't feel comfortable even being naked around just myself like it was just it's really hard to fight this level of of messaging our male peers and leaders sat with us in lessons telling us our bodies were causing them to stumble and think sinful thoughts you are walking pornography oh god yeah we were likened to chewed gum, to licked cupcakes, to crumpled up dollar bills, crushed roses. We were gossiped about and slut shamed over tank tops, shorts, and cleavage. Our highest leaders told us we became pornography to men when we dress immodestly. And yet the woman is the one who's objectifying herself, but you're mm-hmm. saying she's pornography for showing her shoulders. God, it's just wild. It's like, I'm so glad they changed that. Because it's one of the things like 
within their realm to, I don't know. Kelsey, Kelsey the chat from Canada. Kelsey, TBS. Thank you, Kelsey. Wow, the UK is really holding it down today. The Commonwealth. <laughs> <laughs> That's Canadian dollars. Oh, com- Canadian dollars. I think so. I know they had their own dollars. Yeah, they got their own dollars. It's not Canadian pounds. It's not US dollars. What is going on up there? <laughs> <laughs> Wacky, and insulin is like four dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Should we uh, go on Move to Move on to Ross. Ross. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this kind of feels like the the big thing from this conference for me, just because. I mean, the church getting exposed by the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who exposed the Catholic Church's cover up of sex abuse for doing the same stuff. That's a big deal. And then it, I wish members would just think it through of like, what would it have meant if the Pope had got up after all that without having addressed it meaningfully in any way or like mm. talked about any like thing they'd learned, anything like that, just been like, abuse is bad, which like, Name one person who doesn't know that. Even the people that are doing it know that it's bad. I mean, I people just... People furiously scribbling be, notes. Abuse is it's bad. It's like, really? <laughs> this is the mouthpiece for God on the earth today and that's the best you got? Abuse is bad? Duh. Well, like, And we can sit on chairs now. Yeah, good for him though. I'm glad he got to sit on the chair. He deserves it. Again, it, the deck chairs on the Titanic metaphor, really? <laughs> Thank you, mummy of kittens. From one mummy of kittens oh, to another. I despise how purity culture adds up to never hold a man responsible when you can blame a woman. Yeah. That is the fundamental problem yep. with patriarchy is that it always prioritizes the, the experience, experience perspectives, mm-hmm. and pleasure of men. Mm-hmm. So women, women's experiences are always seen as secondary by nature of patriarchy. Yeah. So, Russell M. Nelson saying abuse is bad. Again, Where's nothing we? is being... I, it's it's like... Uh, the Pope even did come out and say abuse is bad. That's the thing, mm-hmm. is the Pope mm-hmm. did have to address it's it. But pe- it doesn't mean that the system was fundamentally changed. Right. And it's PR 101. Right. Just say that the thing that you've been found guilty of doing is bad, and then they can be like, we've said it's bad. <laughs> like, we've done it. And it's like, you you run the... Hi- you're at the top of the hierarchy. This is a hierarchical system. You're in control of how the systems function. Mm-hmm. And you're doing nothing. And you were found like guilty by this journalist of like you know i think he said something about like god will not tolerate it the church will not tolerate it and it's like you did tolerate it you did like, literally did that is, that is the <laughs> your system is set up to tolerate it yeah. so that the people committing these things don't see any real justice and they're able to just be you know talk, talk with their bishop and then maybe they keep abusing their child maybe that's just you know a potential risk in the sal- salvational arc of a man who is going to be a god someday. <laughs> and again, I mean, this, I, another, I feel like this whole, as much as I don't like using the word gaslighting too much, just feels like it's become useful vernacular at this point. Mm. I feel like the theme of this whole conference was gaslighting because, again, now you're going to get people who, when people speak up about their abuse, are going to be like, well, I mean, the church itself, like, we obviously don't support abuse. And so, like, that was just like an individual thing that you experienced. And it's like, Okay, but like the four-year-old that's being abused by her bishop doesn't know that. She doesn't watch General Conference. She doesn't know what the church's official conference stance on abuse is. All she knows is that she's been still taught to revere this man as a leader, mm. and he's abusing her, and like that's going to get all jumbled and, you know. Yeah. It's like st- the, the ability for men in power to abuse that power is still there just because you say abuse is bad, especially with like younger kids who have no, you know, they don't know any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. It's one thing to say abuse is bad because they can't say, oh, it's actually bad for grown adult men to interview children about their sexuality privately behind closed doors. They can't come out and say that. So they just this blanket term without saying, again, how what they're actually doing is feeding into that. Are Mm -hmm. they changing their policy where Mm -hmm. bishops, when confronted with sexual abuse cases, call the church's liability legal department, not talking to therapists, not talking to counselors, not talking to anybody who's actually trained in abuse cases. Not talking to law enforcement, who what they, they seem actually to love doing? in every other facet of life. They love the police normally, but they won't call them when kids are at stake. Um, thank you to Megan for the super chat, and thank you to BC. Controversial take, abuse is bad. Wow, so you're brave so brave. Of you to say that. Incredible. Really brave. In 2022, wow. So the other thing that just bugs the shit out of me about this, it, outside of the fact that the church in 2022 continues to have a system that like protects abusers, this is a church that was founded by a pedophile, or a hebophile if we want to be specific about it. This is a church that was founded on middle-aged religious leaders coercing women and girls into secret marriages a lot of the time. I mean, it became less secret as the generations went on, but it's like, 
Your founder was a child sex abuser. Mm. Your, your founder was a child predator. <laughs> the next guy was a child predator. The next guy, I mean, where was Lorenzo Snow? He married a nine-year-old as far as I remember. Like, you, not reckoning at all. Not Because, uh, again, it's like, how do you expect people in this system to kind of get a better sense of when they are a victim of abuse? Because that's been a big problem in Mormonism is people don't know because, like, the they lines get so blurred. Is, they don't know They what, don't, yeah, we did a whole video on consent in They've never seen a healthy Mormonism. system, a right. healthy religious system. All they know is that these men represent God. So it's like, how do you expect anyone to, like, get better at spotting what it looks like? If it's just like, abuse is bad, but we're not going to talk about the fact that like all of the people who made this church into what it was were child predators. <laughs> we can't possibly touch that. Like it, it almost feels more insulting to get up and say abuse is bad than to not talk about it whatsoever. Because it's like, you're just doing it again to protect yourself, which is the very thing that you're accused of doing anyway in this whole like abuse <laughs> situation and you're just repeating that like you haven't done shit no one is not going to get abused because, oh, no, I don't know you never say never but like you saying abuse is bad maybe it like softened a few predators hearts sounds around the like world. you know what? oh crossing that off my to-do well, list not too good to know. It wasn't clear before you know and it's like it, anyone can say abuse is bad but like you won't you won't call it abuse when it's committed by Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, Lorenzo Snow, or all, you know, all these other dudes. Like, you have to be able to call out that that was abuse, that that was, like, Joseph Smith would coerce 14, girls as young as 14, into marriage, secretly. He would marry, like, two teenage sisters at the same time and not let them tell each other. Like, all of that is abuse. Sam, so, didn't, didn't you read the YouTube comment from someone who addressed this very topic and said the reason that Joseph Smith had to marry the 14-year-old was to save her, to offer her salvation? Because that's required. Like, come up with another fucking <laughs> system than pedophilia, I was God. like, you're only underscoring the point. If a prophet comes to you and says, the only way for you to be saved is to get married to me, ding, 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 that's coercion, mm -hmm. that's abuse, you nailed it. <laughs> like, sorry, but I just can't believe that, like, an, an all-powerful deity cannot come up with a different system than one that looks identical to every other cult leader's pedophilia. And if he is going to have to use that exact same system because for some reason his hands are tied, can't imagine why they would be, at least give a very thorough explanation <laughs> and be like, just so you know, there's no sex going on or the, I don't know, I don't even, nothing would make it okay. It would be fucked up either way. But yeah. like, it's just madness <laughs> that the church expects anyone, but people fall for it. Like I saw Mormons being like, so glad he said something. And it's like... D did you think that what this, did he do? Did you think that someone getting up and saying abuse is bad is what's standing in the way of kids <laughs> getting abused or not? I don't think that's what the thing is here. Uh, it's like when Trump gets up and is like human trafficking, very very bad, and it's like okay, like t say one true statement about human trafficking, how yeah. it happens. Can we get some sort of Just intelligent like analysis of the situation? Thing. Yeah, it's like anyone can get up and be like doing things we all know is bad is bad. Sorry, are we being too ranty? I just, this one just really gets to me just because it's like the high and mightiness or the, the piousness that the LDS church will have around children mm -hmm. and like they'll all claim to be all about protecting the children and you know, you shouldn't, we shouldn't have sexual songs on the radio because of the kids and like we shouldn't have all this, this and this and this and this because we've got to protect the kids. let drag queens exist. Right. For the thing of the right. children. It's like drag queen. <sighs> How many drag queens have myself. abused children in the last 100 years? What percentage of people who have led your church have done that? Ooh, ratio. It's high. <laughs> ratio. Yeah, I don't know. I could keep ranting about this, but I feel like I'm just going to keep repeating Go myself. watch our we consent know, video. Right? We, um, we talk, we rant all about this. <laughs> so let's uh, look a little bit more at the, so LDS org or as it's now called or well, this just links straight to the newsroom actually but this is just an overview of what russell m nelson taught so it's what the prophet taught at the october 22 general general conference and then the sub line is keep covenants with god protect the innocent from ab abuse that was your job and you <laughs> failed at that and seek truth again you're not really on the side of that but not too hard okay <laughs> not too hard, just our truth at the end of the day what's important is that you just listen sit down shut up pray and obey. Also the fucking audacity to be like, um, abuse is bad and then announce 18 new temples. <laughs> Just, uh, um, okay, so he talked about how we can find rest from the intensity, uncertainty and anguish of this world by overcoming the world through your covenants with God. 
Making and keeping covenants actually makes life easier, he said. Turn it off like a light switch. <laughs> Making and keeping covenants makes life easier. Okay. I mean, I would kind of agree. If you're, if this is the system you're raised in, I would say remaining faithful to that system generally is the easier path. But it's just interesting that he says that because people always say, you leave the church because it's so much easier than uh, just staying and doing the hard thing. It's like, it's easy when they want it to be. It's hard when they want it to be. It doesn't, there's no real like... There's no right reason. Thank you, Mariah Porter. I can't think of anything funny to say. Just really grateful for you two finding the good fight. Oh, bless you. Thank you so much. For the record, funny comments are not mandatory for not Super mandatory, Chats. Not mandatory, no. they are appreciated. <laughs> um, Thank you so much. He said, overcoming the world is an ongoing process. <laughs> yeah, like repeatedly brainwashing yourself. I was just thinking this morning about the Mormon and general religious aversion to uncertainty is how like, mm. uh, rather than dealing with the complexities of life and learning to strengthen our ability to handle complexity and nuance and ambiguity, it's just like, nope, nope, turn it all off. I've yeah. got this like tiny pinhole thing and if I just keep my sight on that, none of this other scary stuff and will isn't bother it me. funny how we only demand answers to things that like we can't deal with? Like a million things happened every, happen every day just mm -hmm. through random chance that we can deal with just fine that aren't a big deal. Mm -hmm. And we don't question why they happened or what they mean. But then when it comes to things that we don't, like we can't handle, then it's like we demand, we need to add a meaning and a, per you know what I mean? Mm. Like the thing, which are the things that are probably even more unlikely for us to be able to find like valid reasons why they happen. Cause honestly, everything is like a complex web. Um, but you're not like, Oh, why did a hummingbird come to my balcony today? Shit. I need to like assign meaning. And it's <laughs> just like, Oh, that's cool that you just observe it and it happens. But then it's like, with the biggest, like death, which you do not like. None of us like thinking about death. We have to have a reason why we die. We have to know. We have to come up with answers if they're not there because we just cannot sit with that. So we can go to our mansion. That's how. Big old mansion waiting for me after I die. So to overcome Can't the wait. world, we need to repeatedly embrace the living doctrine of Christ, cultivate faith through daily repentance. Daily repentance is such a grim thought to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there's, a, I guess there's a reasonable way you could look at it of like, just kind of assessing how you were that day, you know, like, what was I kind to people in my interactions? Did I keep my ego in check? But it's never that. It's, is it? Have you felt godly sorrow for every minor misstep you may have taken today? <laughs> Making and keeping, also if they say daily repentance, you know that like all the scrupulosity people are going to be finding reasons to daily repent and it's just going to foster, I mean, that's the name of the game, right? It's a shame-based religion that controls through shame. We know this. Making and keeping covenants and continually strengthening our testimonies. Uh, lonely distance. I'm wrangling my new puppy, uh -huh. so I'm only able to half pay attention, but thank you for doing a rundown on conference. So I know what talking points to expect from my father. Oof. Okay, yeah, this just in this this stream is we're turning the camera over to lonely distance. We're gonna get puppy <laughs> cam because that's gonna be way more heartwarming and informative than anything we could read mm -hmm. <laughs> coming from <laughs> downtown Salt Lake City. This um, last we really weekend. appreciate your support for the Thank channel. You, like genuinely, distance. sorry, I know I keep saying it. Um, also, I do feel bad for people that are gonna have to. Like, for us, we don't really have to reckon with family members bringing this shit up. I mean, with you, it's maybe a little bit. But there are people nah, who, people like, their families are, like, immediately, you know. My problem they got a message is that I I always want to talk to people about stuff, and no one ever wants to talk to me. People are always like, I hate when my family texts me or brings this up to me. I'm like, bring it. Bring it. I, I know. Love to. <laughs> I'd love to have someone try and bring up any of this shit with me in real life, because it's so easy to be, like, nice and calm in real life. It's kind of harder online, I think, because mm. also people will just be so aggressive online that but if someone's talking to me face to face they can't like treat me like shit in the same way mm. that they can online so i'll just be really pleasant and be like oh so and just ask questions until i get somewhere you don't I, always get somewhere but i actually did have a conversation about the abuse thing uh the other day um because someone made a comment about the catholic church and like basically being like oh you don't want to leave your kids with the catholics there they'll be in danger there and i was like yeah. Well, the type of did you believe. know? <laughs> but that's why they do it. Like, um, someone left a comment and was like, I'll have you know, my father was a funeral director, so I met many Catholic priests, and they were some of the biggest perverts I've ever met. And I'm like, mm, that may be true. I don't, I've, I've never really met a lot of Catholic priests, couldn't tell you, but it's like, 
it's just insane to me that people just think that because that the, like the Jesus that they believe in somehow like safeguards people against abuse but like believing in a different sort of Jesus renders you like much more vulnerable to being sexually abused as a kid rather than the fucking systems the kids have to operate within and the power structures that kids have to operate in they're both hierarchical what's the difference here <clears throat> he's oh my god this is again this is just feels like sticking in the knife he said President Nelson affirmed the savior's teachings and the church's start stance stand on abuse um, which he referred to as a grievous sin and asked fellow saints to help protect the innocent. Why don't you protect the innocent? Well, it's such bullshit to be like, ask your fellow saints to protect the innocent. Like, yeah, obviously do that too, but it's like... Let me be clear, any kind of abuse of women, children, or anyone is an abomination to the Lord. Again, but then like, what about polygamy? It was fundamentally coercive to women and children, fundamentally abusive to women and children. And you won't rec so like, is God grieving over that? Are you grieving over that? Because he's saying, I grieve whenever anyone is harmed. Like, do you grieve for Helen Mark Kimball? He mourns and we all mourn for each person who has fallen victim to abuse of any kind. Those who perpetrate these hideous acts are not only accountable to the laws of man, what the laws of man that you protected them from, <laughs> when bishops would call your law firm to see what they should do, and you were like, well, they sound repentant, send them on their way. God, this is so rich. Laws that you have actively legislated to prevent from <laughs> President Nelson urged Latter-day Saints to study the aids on the church website, be alert for potential victims, and act promptly to protect them. It's like, are you teaching consent now? Again, are you rehashing church history to call attention to the fact that, like, powerful... Because it's tale as old as time that men in... Like, religious leaders, men, men in power, will abuse people. Like, that happens a lot you have a church that you are the head of that is that exact system you are ugh, i'm losing my i'm losing my ability to speak <laughs> reasonably because i'm just like i just want to scream because it just feels so gaslighty and uh, it's like you don't <sighs> just move on um, the prophet also, oh, look at that. The prophet also warned against the adversary's efforts to blur the lines between what is true and what is not true. There you go. Ooh. Wonder why that was thrown in right after you talk about how we need to apparently grieve for abuse of all kind, unless the abuse was carried out by a church leader. God is the source of all truth. The, ch the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints embraces all truth that God conveys to his children, whether learned in a scientific laboratory or received by a direct revelation This from is him. from an active denier of evolution. And DNA science. One of the most... <laughs> uh, is he an active denier of evolution? Yeah. So. Yeah. I just read a, a quote from him talking about that, and it's like, at BYU, they teach that this is one of the most... Uh, like substantiated theories in science every branch mm -hmm. of science of biological science confirms that this is the process that's at play and he's like no i think everything's just existed how it's been for the last six thousand years also i mean it's just like a total like it's just a thought terminating thing to say because it's like it's obviously not true because there is so much truth that the church rejects like all of the church's like truth claims about the Book of Mormon, the Book of Abraham, all their scriptures, like it just there's just so much. There's just so much solid scientific proof that that stuff is bullshit. And then of course he announces like eighteen new really swanky buildings that people will have to give ten percent of their income to attend. Uh, it's kind of impressive that they're still even bringing up the Book of Mormon. You know? I know. <laughs> the Book of Mormon video series, season four. They're on season four. Whoa. <laughs> um, Are they doing brown face again? <laughs> <laughs> I promise that increased time in the temple will bless your life in ways nothing else can, he said. Not if you were an early uh, Mormon kid who was abused in a temple. You ever try masonry? I hear it's pretty similar. Okay, that felt rough. Should we get? To, <laughs> should we move right on to Jeffrey R. Holland? <laughs> yeah, I do. I guess I just want to say, I don't know. I always hope to be like sort of, well, like eloquent and put together and not have my triggered egoic state, you know, like dominant. I don't like when I'm on a stream or in a video and I'm just like, ah! 
But sometimes it's just like, we are talking about the abuse of children and your church was founded by a guy who did that. Mm. And continuing to believe in this church kind of depends on sweeping the abuse of children under the rug outside of whatever's going on in the modern church. Like mm. even putting all that aside, which is, you know, a huge deal. You, you cannot have Mormonism without the abuse of women and children. And so, especially when it's children, it just mm. is like, it tugs at the heartstrings. And it just brings this like white hot rage into me that I don't get very often in Mormonism these days. Mm -hmm. But I'm just like, stop being such a fucking coward and admit that children have been raped because of your religion, because of the guy who founded this and then all the guys that led it after that. Like this is real stuff. Like you can have your little magical worldview, right? And it's like, Religious people always act like they're so persecuted. And it's like, this is why people are so sketched out by religious people a lot of the time. Because there's like power structures involved and kids get abused and like there's real stuff. So it's like you have these little magical worldviews because you're too terrified to confront your own death and you're too terrified with the uncertainty of being a homo sapiens. I get it, it can be a nightmare. <laughs> but it's like your magical thinking has got children raped. Like it's real. And there's th th these talks like a lot of the time I just hear the shit that Mormon leaders say and I'm like oh well they're crazy like who really you know I feel sad for the people that buy into it but I'm just like well that's life homo sapiens are wild and they're not very reasonable and like but then it's just when it comes so close to like such real issues like this and it's children it's just hard let's move we're, on well we're reading it in the chat Annika says I was sexually abused as a child by my uncle who was LDS my nuclear family is non-religious but my extended family is all strictly LDS my family members try to cover it up within our family yeah how um, my extended family still acts like it never happened like I should have no problem being around my uncle after he abused me for years so sorry again uh, Mormonism fosters that kind of thing because again patriarchy always preferring the experiences perspective and pleasure of men and so even if it's acknowledged in any way, which they do their best to try not to do, right? It's like, we have perfect families. We're going because to heaven together. Again, Nothing bad happens here. If you talk about it, we'll kill you. Yeah, like, they have to, because sweep it under the, rug. the type of religion that Mormonism is, it has to maintain this feeling of superiority. Mm. So they have to believe that because they believe in all the right magical ideas, that children don't get abused in the way that they do in, say, the Catholic Church. So to maintain like belief in the superiority of their church, they have to sweep stories like that under the rug. And it's like, how many how many times have we had that story of someone who grew up in a Mormon family, told so even many. told their parents that they were abused by an uncle and got in trouble, and then like their mum never believed them, their dad never believed them, because it is literally like that's a pretty big fucking red flag when hearing that a family member, that your own kid was sexually abused by someone in your religion, you're more needing to protect your religious worldview than you are to protect your kid. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what that's why we do this channel, right? It's because like families are so affected by this church that claims to be all about family. And then if it is acknowledged, there's also the caveat of like, well, you need to forgive. And all the emotional weight gets left yep. on the victim yep. to just be fine, to keep sweet, While to forgive, you're still going to church and repenting. hearing all these messages about how you're inviting it if you are to this or to that or dressing like this or dressing like that. Mm -hmm. It's so fucked up. I'm so sorry that so that sorry. happened to you. Oof. Blind loyalty is the most toxic trait, yeah. <sighs> God, yeah, it's fucking brutal to imagine victims speaking up in a system. And it, 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 it's the same as the Catholic Church. It's the same as all of them. Like, it shouldn't be surprising, but it still just feels so gut-wrenching every time because you're like, this is your child. Or like, this is like someone in your own... This is... I just can't... It's wild that humans, like, obsession with cult-like thinking runs so deep that they will literally protect their magical thinking worldview over children in their families. Someone commented recently and was like, if you think this is bad, you should look at the Old Testament prophets. And I was like- Yeah, we know. Yeah, it says something about the kinds of people you are propping up as I moral know. leaders. That... Maybe you should take a hard look at that. How many you times think about do it. we Not hear... everybody is having sex with children. Maybe you should look into what they have to say. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. How many times do we hear people justify children being abused in Mormonism 
by the fact that the Old Testament prophets did it. And it's like, that's what we're saying. It's fucked. It's all fucked. That's what religion breeds this, especially patriarchal, hierarchical religions. Should we move on to old, we move old on. Jeff? Um, while we're pulling that up, I'll also mention that this weekend was also the first time a black woman has spoken in conference in 2022. Yeah. It's like, on the one hand, great, awesome. Tough Glad to know how to feel about that one, isn't <laughs> in it? In 2022, first time, it's like, oof. It's like, well done, I guess. <laughs> like, people uncovering your racism is, like, forcing you to show, like, a, a slight nod to, like, not being racist. Uh, only 50 years like after you were actively campaigning against civil rights? Good yeah. for you. It almost... <laughs> people really do change. <laughs> Just the fact that they did it shows that they deliberately didn't do it for all this, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a, a funny uh, meme headline in there somewhere. I'll find it. <laughs> it's just kind of one of those things where it's like, I mean, yeah, we want like black women speaking at pulpits, but like, it just feels like, I mean, of course it's being done intentionally for PR to cover up their racism. So it just feels very... They still ask Brad Wilcox to give the prayer at the end, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was the Brad so, Wilcox thing again? Of like, oh, being um, like, what about the white? What about the white yeah. people? No, what about us? Have you ever considered how we feel about all of this? <laughs> it's so insane. It's like really hard to even form thoughts sometimes about how insane it is because it's just like that blatant Trump thing of just like... You know, like Nelson saying abuse is bad has the same energy as Trump being like, I'm the least racist person in the world. It's just like so obvious. But some people buy it. That's what's so wild because they need to buy into it because their psyches are dependent on it. Uh, that's most of the world we live in is like, yeah, my religion. All right. So let's move on. This, we're not really moving on to any lighter topics at any point. It's all pretty shit and heavy. Buckle um, up. But let's get into it, I suppose. Sorry, just thinking about this abuse thing. It's just, it's like one in three women and girls get abused. It's one in three. Mm -hmm. So again, it just feels so brutal for him to get up and be like, abuse is bad, even though they don't do anything to stop it. And their church was founded by a guy who was a child predator. There's not strong enough words that exist <laughs> to say the things I want to say. Oh, I feel you. Okay, what do we next need to talk about? Ooh. Oh, I mean, Holland's what many are calling crocodile tears over the gay youth that he weeps for. He weeps for them. Musket in one hand, Kleenex in another. He's weeping. I saw the meme today, I forget who made it, but it's the, you know, the person in the corner of the room of the party who's like, they don't know. He's like, they don't know that I weep for them. And they're all like, we're having the best time. We don't care. <laughs> like, everyone's like having a great time. And he's just like. It'd be funny to get a TikTok if you could get hold of a musket and he's just like wiping his eyes with a musket. <laughs> Yeah, so Holland, again, we haven't we haven't watched any of the conference, but from what I've seen, he gets up and he says that he weeps for every, I don't know what language he used, but he weeps for every LGBTQ person. But then he also said um, he weeps for them also knowing what was at, what's at stake. So it's just like the homophobia is still in the, you know, you're saying you're weeping because you want us to feel like you're not homophobic, but then you, f you say a homophobic thing with it. So it's mm -hmm. like... Cool. like so sorry you're being forced to be homophobic that must be really hard for you mm -hmm. this is sort of the irony uh juxtaposed with the last topic is that i mean someone commented recently on our uh video with maddie easton who commented on the jeffrey r holland thing um because as we know jeffrey r holland called him personally out for giving an approved by address approved. at his graduation anyway um the person commenting on the video was like this is so horrible that you guys are gay friendly. We just, I just, it would be easier to listen to you if you were decent. And, blah, 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 blah. and I was like, hedonists. it's so crazy how you can just dismiss a long history of child sex abuse and predation, institutional predation and systems that feed into abuse and then hate gay people. Like what a weird mm -hmm. battle to have where you're like, Ooh, two consenting adults is so yeah. bad and awful. The child abuse isn't Religious that bad. Religious leaders and kids. Mm. 
different time. But I hate when adults make decisions for themselves that don't hurt anybody else. That bothers me so much. The decay of society. I know, and they were like, we, it would more people would listen to your message if you weren't so openly gay friendly. And it's like we probably don't want them listening to our message then. Like that's not the message we want to send. But it's just so like thoroughly ingrained in that person's worldview that homophobia is good and that being gay is hedonism. Apparently, <sighs> yeah. He said, I know many who wrestle with wrenching matters of identity, gender, and sexuality. I weep with and for them, knowing the significant consequences of their decisions. What about the significant impact of your words when you get up and you make a homophobic address at BYU about a student who was a valedictorian <laughs> and had his speech approved and I don't even think said anything like anti-church. It was just literally that he was gay, right? So Matt Easton, who we love, um, did a whole thread on Twitter talking about the fact that Elder Holland did this. Because um, Elder Holland, after that whole thing, wrote a letter to Matt's dad apologizing for possibly hurting his or his mother's feelings. Um, but he'd never touched base with Matt, or, you know, it was very much just like probably wanting to keep his parents in the church. Yeah. It's like, how is that mourning with those who mourn again? Again, it's, it is crocodile tears. It's, it's, I, I weep for you. And it's like, well, why don't you weep with us? Why don't you actually like, internalize some of that because again the only struggle that gay people you know lgbtq as the whole umbrella the only, most of the problem that we are all facing in this world is literally people like jeffrey r holland who are saying mm -hmm. you're so wicked and god mm -hmm. can't handle this and you shouldn't have equal rights like everybody else even though it doesn't hurt us like fucking dallin h oates saying oh if if every if we allow homosexuality to continue uninhibited, then within a generation, we will not be able to, like, our population will absolutely diminish, and we can't uh, allow homo uh, homosexuality to uh, allow us to commit national suicide. And it's like, you think that's what's happening? The actual suicide of gay kids is around. Yeah, you're like, the gay gayness isn't like a disease that you can just catch and everybody's gonna get it and I then nobody's, nobody's gonna, gonna, gonna have, have children. Kids. Like It's like, we don't wanna have kids because of people like you are running the world and making it a horrible place for kids and protecting people who abuse kids. Yeah, it's like, this is just like a, a absolutely childish view. like. Less than childish view, because children are more capable of understanding. If you just say uh, to a child, like, oh, yeah, sometimes men marry men and women marry yeah, men. They they're like, shit. okay. Yeah. yeah, seriously. If they haven't received any messaging about it. But these guys literally cannot even cannot comprehend or begin to. Outside uh, of the framework of homophobia. Yeah, it's insane. Insane. And it's, oh, I hate how Holland and Russell, it's just like the same bullshit, isn't it? Of like, we have a problem. They have a problem with racism. So instead of the addressing the racism, they do a PR move and they have the first black woman ever speak in 2022. Instead of addressing the fact that they cover up child sex abuse and that their church was founded by a child predator and led by child predators for ages, they just get up and say abuse is bad and hope that that will do the trick. <laughs> instead of addressing their homophobia, they just get up and say like, I cry sometimes about gay people right after I finish giving a speech like attacking gay people. It's like, no, you're not doing shit. Like you're just like creating the facade of empathy, and I don't know, I don't know Jeffrey Holland. maybe he does in his like weird twisted worldview weep for LGBTQ people, but it feels like, I don't know, it just kind of feels like the thinking would advance a little bit if there was more genuine empathy. Mm. But you never know, because he's very church broken, like completely brainwashed by Mormonism, so maybe he does genuinely feel empathy for LGBTQ people and is unable to stop being homophobic, I just, I don't know. Yeah, it's kind it's, of a it's, tight Because bind. I just imagine he's in such an insane headspace, you know, as yeah, a Mormon apostle. And it seems like the older he gets, the more oh, yeah. fundamental yeah. he gets. I mean, ooh, that, that clip of him talking about how he wants to force the missionaries to stay on the mission, how we turn off the cameras and tie them down, and it's like, holy shit, this guy Saying is unhinged. Thank you, Anabolic, Anabolic Boy, Boy, for the super chat. We really appreciate that. That's one dollar for each of us. Woohoo! After we're YouTube takes some of it. <laughs> oh yeah. One more of those and we're headed to the dollar store. <laughs> yeah, bullshit. So we <laughs> we won't be able to read Matt's whole thread. It's worth going and checking out. <laughs> uh Keith Chris Jansen said it reminds me of the office and Michael yelling, I declare bankruptcy. <laughs> That's all the church is doing with their Abuse it's is so bad. True. There I fixed it. It's so true though. <laughs> um 
So Matt said, did you weep, Elder Holland, when your musket fire speech inspired a student to yell slurs at queer students? Did you weep when my friend's ward spray painted the F word on his car after he came out in a faithful context over the pulpit? Did you weep when Carlisle Marsden died by suicide after being outed at BYU? What about Stuart Mattis, DJ Thompson, Clay Whitmer, Brian Michael Agnew? Sorry if I'm pronouncing some of these wrong. Um, he listed a lot of names. I can only speak from my own experience, though I know many share similar feelings in saying that I only wrestled with my sexuality because I was taught by the church to hate it, to reject it. Once I let go of that shame-filled worldview, my life changed. I'm so happy as a gay man. I'm so proud to be queer. I have no need to wrestle with my identity, no need to be wrenched with pain because there's nothing about my sexuality that I need to be ashamed of. The only reason queerness is seen as bearing a heavy cross is because people like Elder Holland are the ones making it heavy. It doesn't have to be a burden. It can be and is a joy, a gift, a characteristic worthy of separation, celebration. From my view, Elder Holland is fearful of the how significant the consequences of our choices will be because he knows once we embrace who we are, the church loses power over us. We aren't lost when we choose our truth. We are finally, for the first time, found. So beautiful for a Twitter thread. Oh, yeah. Whew. Yeah, anyway, that's the general gist. But I think... Who's who's really buying Elder Holland's shtick? I mean, again, I don't really... Mormons. <laughs> All yeah. 700,000 active ones. But it doesn't make anything go away. It doesn't change the fact that there's still no new revelation from God on like how best they can... You know, it doesn't actually change anything. You're just trying to like have like a modicum of empathy displayed publicly so you don't seem quite so homophobic. But like nothing has changed. And in the eyes of the, the type of... Because some members of Mormonism, they don't fucking wrestle with the church's homophobia. Like that guy who left that comment. Because in their mind, being gay is just so ingrained in their brains as like a bad thing that like they're not... They don't give a shit. Like it's just like a worldly trend. It's just simple, whatever. But for like the ones that are, I can't imagine that hearing that Jeffrey R. Holland weeps for them is like going to be that meaningful at moving the needle. You know, I still feel like the ones that are going to leave the church because of the church's homophobia will do so anyway. Like it's not going to stop any kind of... Hemorrhaging, you know. Mm -mm. Harmless. Thank so you. spoil yourselves, baby. Aww. Aww, thank you so much. That's really and nice. Will. <laughs> what do you think? Oh boy. It doesn't even feel like it's doing anything to make the church less homophobic because, like, even at kind of a base level, because it doesn't, it's just going to be another way that, like, pa pe Mormons will passive aggressively be homophobic. They'll be mm. like, I weep for them. And this it's is, like, that, that's still homophobia. You can't, saying that you're sad about it doesn't make it less homophobic. This, this to me, it's, it's like the equivalent of someone in the Middle Ages being like, I weep for left-handed people, <laughs> knowing the choices that they must make. You need to do it. You need to do that as a TikTok, Tanner. It is so sad to me. <laughs> Seriously. Because that is, is the same fucking thing. It is the same fucking thing. It's like, it's not a choice and it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect you at all. Even if it was a choice, it would still be fine. <laughs> yeah, if it's consensual, it doesn't matter. Who the fuck cares? I feel like the amount the LGBTQ community has had to like convince people like that, like that they're born with it or that it's not a choice. And then it's like, yeah, but even if it was, <laughs> like why? Why yeah. do you care? It's a choice to wear red on Thursdays, and you should not make that choice. It hurts me so bad. Don't you see society crumbling? We ought not wear red shirts on Thursday. It's like, you are so in such a twist about this. Your magic underwear just all bunched up. Maybe you need to take a little walk or something. <laughs> oh, they always take a fucking walk. You know what's a choice is uh, telling bishops to not contact law enforcement when they find out that a child is in an unsafe, abusive situation. But the guy might repent. The guy sounds like he feels <laughs> bad, so I mean, I don't think we need to worry. Uh, Feather Phoenix said, left-handed here, just confirming, no, it's not mm -hmm. a choice, just like being gay is not. That's not true. You could choose to be right-handed at any point, and I weep for you personally. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, this is a good comment. It's not to convince the world they're not homophobic, it's to convince the members so when they're confronted with the homophobia, they can stop thinking and just reject it outright. Exactly. Yeah, because have, Jeffrey R. Holland is good at this, right? Just like the public displays of emotion that if you are a believing member watching, you feel emotion. So, I mean, anyone that can, in that context stir up your emotions has the potential to have power of you and obviously mm. we know that these people do have power of him because it's like they people literally uphold him as an apostle of jesus christ mm. 
So it's like, yeah, it, it just means that now when, for certain members, when homophobic issues come up, they just remember that feeling they had and they're like, but I know he really cares. And so I know that it's all fine with God. Uh -huh. And it's like, well, people could do that about anything. People, like, as you just said, someone could have done that about left-handedness. Like, it doesn't mean anything. Um, the, the basis of fragility, of be that white fragility or straight fragility, not being able to reckon with other people's lived experiences all comes down to people's idea of, I'm a good person because I'm on the right team. I'm, I'm in the LDS church. I'm doing my best in it, which means I'm a good person. So if somebody points out something to me that I'm doing that is either racist or sexist or homophobic, I can't, I can't accept that. Because then I have that. to I can't challenge my perceived identity. Exactly. Instead of us all just having kind of a healthier mindset of like, sometimes I do things that are harmful and sometimes I do things that are helpful. And, you know, we're all just kind of a mixed bag. And it's like, you, you really, life is a lot easier without a superiority complex. Because then when people call you out for stuff, you can be like, oh yeah, without it, like wrecking your whole worldview. Because right. if your perceived identity hinges upon you feeling superior to others, well then you're fucked. You're going to have to do a lot of mental gymnastics throughout your life to maintain that. Because the truth is that no one is superior. The sign of a good person is not never making a mistake. Mm -hmm. It's acknowledging when you make mistakes. And Which this is does <laughs> absolutely does not do institutionally and does on not. record for being proud of not apologizing for mistakes. Uh, I love that Nemo is in the chat. Hi Nemo. Um, you know, Nemo's coming to Utah. Oh so. yeah. And he said, hot take like meat eaters crying over factory farming. Stop contributing to the bad situation instead of crying about it. And love that you mentioned factory farming. Mm -hmm. Yay! Whoa, it is a <laughs> super chat. duper chat party. Thank you. Annie Lyons. Love this content. Thanks. Thank Content you. people love the gay agenda again. I feel so much joy being a pan-romantic <laughs> transgender person. I no longer have the weight of the church wearing on my shoulders and the people like Elder Holland are distant past. Yeah. Good for you. Beautiful. Um, I love that we're being funded by the gay agenda. It really does, you know. Oh, absolutely. Emphasize yeah. all that's going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because the church sure puts a lot of ads on our videos, <laughs> which I'm not mad about. If they want to spend their advertising dollars on us, fair dues. <laughs> Me and the boys on our way to hate on all. <laughs> mm. um, if you want to see the comments we made on the Elder Holland's musket talk that was targeting Maddie Easton, we've we, we could put that in that. the notes as well. Well, we're going on an hour. Should we? I guess one more thing I wanted to mention is I actually didn't. Someone just told me that someone said this at conference, but apparently there was a talk where a, a guy said your personal revelation doesn't trump what the prophet has said, which I just thought was an interesting take. So because, what good is it? <laughs> <laughs> because so much of Mormon apologetics kind of hinges on this idea that like, well, sometimes prophets speak as men and that's why we have personal revelation. So I not, this is the point I always bring up. Like if you were around during Brigham Young's time when he's teaching all these atrocious racist things, like how, you know, a black person marrying a white person is an eternal sin and you'd be damned for doing it and you always will. And that, like, you know, black people can't get to the highest degree of heaven and black people are black because of the curse of Cain and because they were unrighteous in the primal realm. If you existed in the church at that time, what, you can't get personal revelation that tells you, like, no, don't believe any of that racist shit? Nope. Apparently not, because your personal revelation doesn't trump what the prophet says. So that just feels like a reversion back to that whole, like, you know, what the prophet says goes, which I thought they were, like, at least kind of in lip, via lip service trying to move away from because they realize how many problems it gets them into. You know? Yeah, but I don't... They always want their cake and eat it. That's yeah. the thing. It's double speak, <laughs> isn't it? There's a reason double speak is a part of all systems like this. I need to just remember that instead of thinking that calling out the double speak is going to do anything. Double speak's the name of the game, I guess. Absolutely. You speak from both sides of the mouth and yeah. you get all your bases covered. <laughs> um, we also heard that Gerald Cause talked about being stewards of the earth, but then like randomly transitioned into talking about procreation. So that's funny. <laughs> wanted to bring it up. <laughs> oh, Nemo said, uh, also it was we... Renland. He tried, uh, tried on the landmine that is Nephi killing Laban. Oh Ooh, my God. That's a tough one. That was a shelf breaker for me was I had read, you know, for two years was just like digging into Mormon history, multiple hours a day, reading every, every single book, listening to every podcast I could. And then I was like, maybe I just need to read the Book of Mormon one more time. And I opened up to Nephi killing Laban and I was like, 
this is garbage. This is horrible. If a, if a voice told me that I needed to behead a drunk, defenseless person. Check yourself <laughs> into a facility immediately. Yeah. But, but, uh, when you read that, I'm assuming by then you already knew that the plates weren't even used in the translation process. Yeah, so I was like, what is this even for? Yeah. <laughs> this is not necessary. It really doesn't seem like we needed to bother with all the... Yeah. However you make gold plates. Yeah. Um, when, I feel like every now and then the church will do a little, one rando will do like a little nod to being stewards of the earth, which kind of bothers me. Cause then it's like, again, that then is like a thing that members can point to whenever people accuse them of like, Oh, why is your church like in pouring money into industries that are destroying the planet, you know, through its. Largest firm. cattle farmer yeah, why is owner your in the state of Florida. <laughs> if, and... <laughs> I thought that you accepted what science says. I thought you accepted like anything that is true. The church accepts whether it was in a scientific lab or from God. It's like, but you're like the, one of the biggest cattle ranchers. <laughs> Russell M. No okay, Russell M. Nelson hasn't been practicing science since like what the forties or something. In his mind, uh, take your vitamins is the cutting edge <laughs> of the voice of science. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> But, and then even when he, a respiratory heart surgeon, was like, you got to believe in COVID. People were like, no. No, Speaking actually. as a man, my personal revelation trumps the prophets. Double speak, double. That's the theme, isn't it? It's just double speak. I'd say the Mormons are even better than double speak. Double it's like speak. quadruple speak. <laughs> I want to rename. Can you guys help us? I want to give this stream a different name once we end the stream, just to make it, you know, more clickable. I'm like, I feel like it should be called... Gaslighting and double speak at general conference. That is. Anyone got any better suggestions though? <laughs> You'd click that. I mean, come on. <laughs> mm. Well, anything else you think we should touch on? Wow, Keith Key. Christie Hansen coming Give in Keith hot. Give Keith a chance. Great <laughs> recap. Mr. Burns needs to stop announcing all the temples that will never be built. Yeah, we it, keep hearing that, right? That he keeps announcing temples, and then the temple department is like, we don't have plans. For and we know it. people connected with the temple building departments who are like, this is unhinged. Like the guy keeps announcing it, and we don't have we don't have permits. We don't mm. have the means. We don't have the staff to do this. And it's just like, go, 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 go for reasons to project the image of success and to increase land holdings. Because at the end of the day, we're an investment real estate company, first and foremost. God's really gone lax, Hux. It's <laughs> the, like the child predation is only a secondary issue. <laughs> Michael, Michael Turner. Turner. Here's a little more profit for exposing the nonprofit F. Nelson and his leaders. Oh, y'all have been so, so kind today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We eating good tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get dinner, Indian takeout. Wow, I out. know. <laughs> um, yeah, they used to have to have, well, I assume, it seems like under every other prophet when they announced a temple, it was because they actually did have plans to build a temple there. And now it's just like manifesting. <laughs> it's like first prophet to be into manifesting. He's like, speak into existence, Han. Nelson is a master manifester. I love that. Also, I looked at the list of where they announced the temples. It seems like a lot of them are in like Central South America, which I just thought was interesting because no one's fucking joining in Europe. Because they're also prideful. Because of their pride. So prideful. Yep. <laughs> Whew. What was the other thing that... um it doesn't matter. There was like some other thing about um, that Nelson went on about like in the 70s and now is a prophet and is going on about it now, but I can't remember. Unconditional it. love. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Sorry, suddenly God's so, like, love is this unconditional. Up. <laughs> That's, it, ain't that just a true disciple of Jesus? Like, I've been sitting on this for 50 years, okay? Y'all have been saying God's love is unconditional and it is not. It is very, very conditional. I'm glad I settled that for you. Aren't you glad? <laughs> that we have a prophet on earth today. Well, when I was 18 at BYU Idaho, just turned 18 and had my 24 year old boyfriend who knew me as a 17 year old in England, not weird at all. He used to believe that God's love wasn't unconditional, but he would talk about it as if it was a deep doctrine with me. And I just think that's interesting. It's a little secret that God actually He's hates some of his kids. <laughs> He does have But you don't get to know me. that till you become one of the favorites and then he tells you. He's like, fuck those guys, yeah. <laughs> Mm. Well, um, it all feels like it, nothing was really unexpected this conference, right? Mm. Like another thing, another thing we've got to mention with the strength of youth is like 
It's a classic strategy when cults and high demand groups start losing members that they loosen the rules because of course the dominant narrative in those groups is people are leaving because the rules are too hard, which is actually not true a lot of the time. So they are presumably really like easing the rules, well, for PR purposes too, mm. but also probably hoping that it will help youth stay in the church because like the juxtaposition between like how most people live and the, for the strength of youth had got wider and wider and wider. But it's not going to work because they're actually just kind of, even though overall the messaging is still very high control, it doesn't help groups like that retain members when they like loosen the control, basically. Mm-hmm. Like the, the, these churches, these high demand religions and cults, like f- the reason they work is because of the control mechanisms. Like the beliefs are actually a little bit like insignificant. People think that they're Mormon because of you know, the doctrines about Christ or whatever, blah, 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 blah. But they're Mormon because of the control mechanisms and Mm. people are Scientologists because of that and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Like, all these groups use the same psychological control mechanisms and that's the reason people are devoted to the group, however much they have been, like, convinced that it's because of the doctrines. So when you ease up the rules, it doesn't do what people think, but it seems to be a strategy that all high-control groups try when they're on the outs. Like, Mm. I feel like John DeLynn's been saying that for, like, 10 years. Like, Mm. it's a classic thing that groups will do. And it's such a silly peripheral thing. Yeah. To get yeah, to give that. Yeah. But it doesn't act it's not going to help because it's just going to give people more opportunities to individuate even just through clothing, through anything. Like more rules keep people more controlled. Mm-hmm. So less rules are not going to keep people in the church because the church is about control at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Nelson did say that in the coming days, we're going to see the manifestations of the power of God unlike ever before. So exciting. So just really look forward it's to that. I love so how it's always a future thing, like those yeah. patriarchal blessings that it like promise all these stuff. And it's like, I wonder when that's going to It's like, don't happen. leave until that happens. At least wait out till that happens. You so guys. will be waiting a long time. Mark his words. You're going to see the news report any day now that's like, we're witnessing an unprecedented influx of women named McKaylee on the Utah corridor finding their keys miraculously. We are witnessing the power of God manifest like never before. <laughs> <So stupid>. <laughs> <laughs> Has Nelson prophesied anything lately? Uh, no, actually what's so cool about being a master manifester is that you don't even have to prophesy anything to be considered a prophet. It's incredible how I got my dream job without ever doing any work. As a heart surgeon. <laughs> hey, I loved your tweet that was like, as a writer who doesn't write, I can actually empathize with being a seer who doesn't see. Like, That's true. <laughs> yeah. At Nemo, unlike ever before, easy when they've never been manifest. I know, it's the last one, so never say never. You can imagine it. Yeah, I feel like this conference was just essentially a nothing burger. I really don't like the phrase nothing burger. I don't know why. Just this is my of... first time hearing it. Really? I like it. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, for the people that just wanted a little, you know, it's like the people at the doTERRA conference, sometimes mm-hmm. you just need the boost of community and that keeps you That's going in the what thing it is. for longer. It's so sad because every year prior to the conference, everyone's getting all hyped. Like, I wonder I what know. the big announcement is going to be. And finally, we're going to see the power of God made manifest unlike ever before. And then it's just like this same old stuff of like, I'm going to give you a revolutionary new approach to life. It's called reading your scriptures, praying and obeying. (laughs) It's called engaging in cult rituals (laughs) that wire your brain to still be brainwashed by the groups. But oh, the comfort and familiarity. Mm. Oh, the getting to watch. Oh, the brain loves familiarity. (laughs) From TV. It's so great. It's like, yeah, anything you do regularly, your brain wants to keep doing. That's why they tell you to bear your testimony even when you don't have one. That's why you tell you to read your scriptures every day, spend more time in the temple. It's like, yeah, if you spend a lot of time in the temple, potentially, I mean, the way human brains work, for a lot of people, they'll probably keep wanting to go to the temple because, again, the brain wants to do what's familiar. So, I mean, he's right that it will help you well he said it will change your life in ways i wouldn't say it will change your life in ways nothing else can but it will keep you in a high de- in this high demand group i love when everyone when anyone is like i just can't deny like this has changed my life and i was like what were you doing what before you were still a mormon you were a believing mormon. mormon you're just like even more hyper mormon now great <laughs> you had one drink one time i can't deny the experiences i had i just have a testimony okay well have you ever prayed to a different deity have you ever attended a different congregation you ever tried believing something that's right? why they love cutting out the converts and that's why i gotta keep doing this because i'm like guys it's bullshit trust me <laughs> 
Yeah, why would God wait this long to reveal his true power? What is his strategy? He's playing 5D chess. <laughs> <laughs> Nelson, we're changing uh, the names of all the primary classes. Isn't it wonderful to see the power of the Lord made manifest? Literally, literally that, that, is, that like, is Mormonism in a nutshell. Yeah. The Again, biggest... arranging the deck chairs on the sinking Titanic, being like, wow, we are absolutely revolutionizing the way that the titanic is organized this is incredible nothing like the ship has ever seen before i think you should change our thumbnail to say rearranging the deck chairs on the sinking titanic okay i'll even get the I titanic just... i'll have him on the titanic love it that. that's brilliant all right yeah well thank you guys so much for joining us thank you for all this super just chats. Us vent. i didn't realize how much i needed to vent oh i've got more in the private <laughs> rendezvous <laughs> Are we, uh, are we filming after this? No, just chat. I mean, we could. I've got, still got time. <laughs> no, just chatting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you so thank much you. for joining us. Thank we you love so you all much. so we'll much. Be super and I uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Hope your day's wonderful. Yeah. Bye.